So now uh, today's lecture will be done uh, by Professor Vasanthi Tevanesam. Uh, she's online now. Uh, so she, I mean, there's no need to introduce Madam, uh, but I'm going to introduce her simply because I think that some of you all may not have learned from her. Okay. So uh, Professor Tevanesam uh, is from the seventh batch. Uh, she joined the faculty as a student in 1967 and then uh, joined the faculty initially as uh, a staff member in 1975 uh, and then went overseas uh, in 1984 and then came back in 1989 and has been uh, in the faculty, was in the faculty since then till her retirement uh, in December 2015. Uh, now that is a very brief accounting, but a few things I wanted to point out. Madam is one of the few uh, academic staff who stayed in Sri Lanka to work for Sri Lanka, to work for the faculty during the 82-83 troubles, during, came back during 89 and stayed back during 89. Uh, I think many of you all were not even born then. Uh, but these were very difficult times for the country. This is when a lot of the academics uh, in Sri Lanka, a lot of students, a lot of people were leaving the country and never coming back, right? And it is very, very rare to find someone who came back, uh, not who stayed and now went out for training and also came back, right? Uh, and Matt, that is the level of Madam's commitment to Sri Lanka, to developing uh, Sri Lanka, our microbiology, to the faculty, to everything, and it is a hallmark of all the work that she has done since then. Uh, she has been instrumental. I mean, she is the godmother of microbiology in Sri Lanka. She started the MD program, uh, and the MDs that we do today are largely due to her. Uh, we are all her students. I mean, uh, everybody in the department today, we are all her students. We are her late students, I would say. I mean, I learned from her in the mid-2000s, and by that time, she had already taught generations of students. Um, the, everybody in the faculty today uh, who has ever been in the faculty, they are all her students. Uh, so we thought when, when you said that you wanted a lecture on uh, antibiotics, we thought the best person to do this would be Madam, because she has with her years of experience that none of us have. Uh, and when any of us, I mean, I'm not a clinical microbiologist, but even when the clinical microbiologists are stuck, she is the person that anyone would turn to anywhere in the country, right? So uh, we thought that, and since you all, many of you all may not have had the opportunity, she's a fantastic teacher. I mean, we remember the microbiology that she taught us 20 years ago, right? So uh, we thought this is a great opportunity to let you all uh, learn from someone like that. And to, I mean, even to meet Madam would be a privilege for y'all. So uh, that is why we thought it is uh, a good idea to let Madam do it. Now, there might be some technical issues today uh, because the, I think Madam's internet connection has been a bit on and off. So we'll try our best to have the lecture as scheduled, right? Uh, but if it seems like the internet is very disruptive, I think the weather is also a problem. Uh, so if it seems like the internet is going to be disruptive, we will postpone today's lecture and we will reschedule. Uh, and maybe we will have might have a recorded session with Madam later where you can have a recorded lecture from Madam and maybe a discussion uh, with her. Uh, but for now, we will try our best to uh, continue the session today, right? Madam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Hello, madam. Do you want me to put on the video? Yes, madam. Thank For you. Do you while. want me to put uh, so that they can okay, see? Okay, I don't quite know what my hair is like, but still. <laughs> right, madam. This is just so that they can get to know you, madam. Okay, that's okay. I'll just right. Okay, now that's better. Okay. Uh, do you want? I will knock it off when I talk and hope for the best for the internet connection. Uh, I need to share my screen. So if I can be given permission to share my screen. Uh, TRC, can you make Madam co-host, please? Yes, yes, Madam. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, PEMSA, for inviting me for this lecture. And I think I owe it really to the Department of Microbiology. Uh, I must tell you that since I retired at the end of 2015, I have not lectured to Perdenia uh, medical faculty undergraduates. And that was uh, on, on principle, really. Um, so it's, it's my first um, sort of uh, time that I'm lecturing or giving uh, a talk to the Perdenia undergraduates. Um, now, I was asked to talk on use of antibiotics in clinical practice. Um, and uh, what I would like you to do really is, uh, because we can't, I didn't expect so many people, by the way. Anyway, uh, the, the, if you have any questions to ask while I am speaking, please put it on chat. If by chance the internet goes off, as it, it, it went off about five times in the 10 minutes I had logged in before eight o'clock, but I've also got an alternative from uh, somebody who lives in my downstairs. Uh, so I might be able to connect up with their internet because they use SRT. I'm on dialogue. Um, but if there is any problem, uh, you know, just put it on chat. As long as I have the internet, I can read it. Otherwise, send me an SMS or, or tell uh, people like Champa to give me a call. Okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. And so now we'll start the lecture. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes, madam. Okay, fine. Right. Thank you. Right. So now one of so, so now one of the uh, principles or one of the first things we have to do uh, in in relation to antibiotics is to ask ourselves the questions: uh, When do we use antibiotics? Now the reason for this is. I mean, like for all drugs, you need to ask, okay, when do you use antihypertensive? When do you use the statins, et cetera? But antibiotics has a wider uh, expression than that. And that is that antibiotics don't act on us. They act on microbes or bacteria to be specific uh, that are present uh, within our bodies and causing some damage within our bodies. Now, the in a sense, uh, uh, un unwanted effect of antibiotics is that it, they also have an effect on other microbes that may be colonizing our bodies, um, what we now call the microbiome, because we, as you might already have heard, uh, we have a large number of microbes that are found in different parts of our bodies. And obviously, they too might get exposed to these antibiotics that we are taking in order to knock off one particular uh, group of uh, organisms that are causing damage to the body. Now, when we do that, lots of things can happen that can go wrong. One is that obviously these mi mi the microbiome that exists or coexists with us um, contribute to various functions in our body. And obviously, if you upset that, then you do have the effects of that upset, which I'm not going to talk about now. But, uh, you know, for instance, you get diarrhea uh, because the microbiome of the gut has been disturbed and so on. There are lots of uh, things that can happen. The second and, and equally important um, uh, effect is that the antibiotic gets into the environment. It could get into the environment through our urine, through our feces, um, and through other means. Now, when that happens, the microbes are in the environment also get exposed to antibiotics. And, and, and therefore, uh, the, these microbes within our body and outside our body, uh, obviously, they want to stay alive. And because they want to stay alive, they move their genes around uh, in different ways, which you would have learned in your third year, uh, and become in a sense, impermeable, or they become, uh, the, the antibiotics no longer can cause problems to them. And we call that resistance. Uh, and so multi-resistant organisms is a real problem. And, and it's, it's been a fast in, in increasing problem in the treatment of infections, right? And so there are reasons why we should not use antibiotics. So obviously, we don't want to start there. We want to say, okay, when do you use antibiotics? Now, the, the main place where you use 
uh, antibiotics obviously or the only place really is when there are bacterial infections not viral infections or not fungal infections bacterial infections because antibiotics act on bacterium if you use the word antimicrobial that includes antivirals antifungals and and so on okay uh, now we need to first, as we, as we think about when we use antibiotics, we need to ask ourselves, is there evidence of an infection, right? And we'll talk about each of these, uh, you know, individually. Secondly, we need to ask, what is the site of the infection? Sometimes the site will, you know, tell us, okay, there is likely to be an infection there, right? And we'll look at some examples of that because this question might be answered before that question. Then we need to ask ourselves, is it a bacterial infection, right? And what is or are the likely bacteria to cause infections at this particular site? And then obviously, what are the antibiotics which include these likely bacterial causes in their spectrum of activity? So there, is a, there are some questions and when you start getting used to using antibiotics, it's good if these questions pass through our minds very fast, maybe in a matter of a few seconds. But obviously when we start it, when we start getting into this habit, we need to start independently thinking of each of these questions, right? So let's look at this. Is there evidence of an infection? And I think all of us are agreed that if you have a patient coming in with fever, with or without chills and rigors, that you certainly will think of an infection, right? For a bacterial infection, we might look for raised white count. We might look for an increased CRP. Those are the two common uh, markers of a bacterial inflammatory, uh, induced inflammatory, uh, um, infl bacterial in induced inflammation. Right? Uh, then you might also look for specific features of infection at a particular site. So for instance, uh, you look for local symptoms. Maybe a good example is appendicitis, right? There are very local symptoms. There might be illness and so on. Uh, in osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, you might have dysfunction of the affected site or organ, right? Now, obviously, these local symptoms don't, don't uh, specify that this is a bacterial infection. They just tell you there is inflammation going on, and one possible cause of that might be uh, 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 inflammatory, uh, sorry, an infective cause. Now, I can give you a personal example of that. I have psoriatic arthropathy, and at one period of my life, I used to get very um, marked um, inflammation of my joints, my large joints, and once I had a massive uh, swelling, uh, this was when I was in the UK, uh, of, of uh, what looked very much like a septic arthritis, actually. It was extremely painful, it was very swollen, uh, it was tender and so on. But because I knew I had psoriatic arthropathy, I went along to the rheumatologist and she said she needs to uh, aspirate it. And I asked, are you sure you won't put in an infection? And she laughed at me and, and then aspirated 70 milliliters of uh, synovial fluid, which was sent to the lab that I was locum consultant in at that time. Um, uh, within uh, within a very short period of their receiving the sample, I got a call uh, to say, uh, you've got an infection in your joint. And, and because the septic, uh, the, the cyanovial fluid was full of white cells out of just interest. I went and had a look at the gram stain, it was full of white cells, but I didn't have an infection. I had an inflammatory arthritis, right? So, you know, you have to be very careful that you don't, uh, you know, mix it. And obviously this comes with clinical experience. Um, and, obviously, and the knowledge that you are gaining as medical students and you will continue to gain when you become a doctor. There are also generalized features which point to a particular site of infection. Um, you know, for instance, uh, there might be breathlessness and uh, pleuritic chest pain, which is local, but breathlessness, which is generalized, which might indicate that somebody has pneumonia and so on, right? I'm not going to go into too many details there, but to give you an idea that we need to be at least reasonably certain that there is an infection, right? And then you look for the site of infection. Some of them are very easily found, for instance, in urinary tract infection and in skin infections. Uh, we can, we'll be looking at otitis media later on. 
um, very easily found. But otherwise, in many infections, actually, you need to do tests to find out. And we'll talk about microbiological investigations, which are essential uh, for the number two and number three in this uh, particular slide. Where am I? Okay. Right. Uh, are you okay up to now? Sorry, somebody has sent a chat. Huh. Somebody has asked, is it acceptable to give antibiotics during viral infections in order to avoid a secondary bacterial infection? I will be talking about that. Uh, but if I forget, will you remind me again, please? Okay. Right. So let's move on to... Uh, Right. Now, to ask whether it's a bacterial infection, it's sometimes very obvious. For instance, or we never think of viral infections in relation to UTI, right, urinary tract infections. Uh, we almost never think of viral uh, cause in pus forming lesions like abscesses. You know, we always assume they're bacterial, particularly if these are acute. Uh, we don't even think of fungi. Right? If they're chronic, we might think of fungi. Obviously, there are helpful pointers called like the raised white count and the raised CRP. But very often, it is very difficult um, to make a distinction. And I will be uh, looking at these in spe uh, specifically uh, with sore throat and um, upper and lower respiratory infections. I'm not going to look at diarrhea. If you like, we can talk about it uh, when you ask me questions. Right. Now somebody has said, dear madam, and then left it. Uh, there is nothing there. If you want to come, okay, that's. So if you want, if you want me to uh, answer that, will you let me know, please? Okay, right. There's no question there. Right. Okay. Let. Why has one? Right. So then we move on to what are the likely bacteria to cause infection at a particular site. And I will be doing this more specifically as we go along for the second part of the lecture. Uh, now, for instance, we know that coliforms are the commonest cause of urinary tract infection. But is that correct to say that? I would say yes, if the infection is in women, uh, and they are only um, uh, only predisposing cause is the fact that they have a short urethra. Right? It is said, for instance, that uh, you know, of all the women in the world, uh, a large proportion. I mean, I have read that all women in the world get a urinary tract infection at one time in their lives. I must say that uh, I haven't had a UTI up to now, and I have reached the last decade of my life so maybe I'm an exception or maybe there are the exceptions I think there must be other exceptions but it's a very very common cause of uh, infection in women and coliforms are the most likely but if you take a catheterized man in a hospital uh, or for instance a catheterized woman in a hospital the chances of it being other organisms is is also there right? pneumococcus we will deal with later it's a definite known cause of pneumonia, but as all of you know, there are many, many other causes of pneumonia, right? So the, uh, the, we need to ask ourselves the question, can we find out for certain? Now, with improving my microbiology services, by the way, by uh, Champa made one uh, small mistake when she was introducing me. She said that I started the MD program. That's not true. The MD program uh, started in 1980. Uh, but I refashioned them uh, with the help of a lot of people to make it a program that would provide us with clinical microbiologists in, in the hospital scene. When I came back in 89, there was only one microbiologist in a state hospital and none in the private sector. Uh, so, so we have moved from there now very considerably. And so we do have improving microbiology services uh, in all our large hospitals and some of the next step hospitals as well. And we have microbiologists in the private sector as well. So this, so this means that interaction with the microbiologist, if you have a person with an infection, is always useful to, to make sure that we've got uh, at least a reasonable chance of getting 
the infecting organism and its sensitivities. Because when we know the infecting organism, we know lots of things about how to use antibiotics. Uh, and when obviously when we know its sensitivities, then we know what the appropriate antibiotics could be. Okay. Now, once you've decided that the, the, the patient requires an antibiotic, you need to choose an antibiotic. And the, 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 the first choice that you make is, is the causative organism within the spectrum of activity of the antibiotic that you're choosing, right? And that I think is probably the, the first important principle in the choice of the antibiotic, right? Uh, and I will talk to you a little bit about the spectrum of activity because this doesn't come in naturally to many people, right? Now, obviously, the antibiotic needs to access the site of infection, and there may be some contraindications to the use of antibiotics in, specific, in a specific patient, right? Okay. Somebody wants to know how to take a blood cut during the lecture. I'll do that right at the end because it doesn't come into this, but we can certainly do some, do, do it very, very, I don't have any pictures to show you, but we can do it briefly, right? Okay. So let's go back and summarize what I have said so far. Some key questions when starting antibiotics. Does this patient have an infection that requires antibiotics? Now, I didn't give you this second point. It's useful or necessary in the treatment of this infection. Right? Now, there are many infections where antibiotics have not been shown to be helpful. A good example of that are the vast majority of diarrheas. Right? Most diarrheas, uh, which particularly in adults, um, do not necessitate, particularly the food poisoning diarrhea, so salmonella, the Clostridium perfringens, the toxin-producing Staph aureus. There are many causes of diarrhea, um, and the, the childhood diarrhea of rotavirus and norovirus. Uh, obviously, antibiotics are not useful, right? Uh, and so we need to know in what can, in what situations are antibiotics useful, right? We certainly need to ask the question, as I've mentioned earlier, that we need to do microbiology uh, so that we can try and find the causative organism. This is not always possible, but we, where possible, we must try and do it, right? Now, the information that we need from, these are all coming from the previous slides I showed you, the information that is available for starting an appropriate antibiotic, we must have some knowledge of, right? And that is particularly resistance data, right? And this is something that uh, we need to have, not only globally, for instance, we need to know globally, or at least we know globally that um, medicine resistant Staph aureus or MRSA is a problem in treating patients with Staph aureus infections. But we need to know locally, uh, you know, how often are you likely to get MRSA uh, in contrast to an MSSA. Now in UK hospitals, MRSA infections are very rare, right? And in fact, in UK, um, if, if there are blood culture positives for MRSA in the hospital, with two blood culture positives, the, if, the, if, if the patients have been infected with, from within the hospital, uh, the hospital has to pay a fine of 50,000 pounds. They take MRSA so seriously. Now here, uh, from the time I came back in 89 and when we started building up the data, MRSA is very common, right? And, and we don't pay too much attention to MRSA. Uh, there are local oral antibiotics now for MRSA. And so we just uh, don't, don't do much with it. Uh, we don't get too upset with it, but that's actually uh, something that we need to be thinking about all the time. Uh, Gram-negative bacteria, of course, is a very different story. We have multi-resistant gram-negative bacteria, coliforms, pseudomonads, acinetobacters, and, and obviously these cause loads of problems in treating patients, particularly in intensive care units, right? Right, so finally, just a little word about this choice of word empirical, right? What is an empirical choice of an antibiotic? An empirical choice is when you are 
starting an antibiotic without this kind of data. That means you don't know the actual organism causing the infection. You don't know the sensitivity of the organism. If you do know the organism, you don't know the sensitivity. You don't have complete data. And, and, and so you start an antibiotic, which we would call a best choice antibiotic in that situation. Right? And that is what you call an empirical choice. Right? It's a best choice in the absence of adequate data about the organism and its sensitivities. Okay, is all that clear up to now? Yes, madam. Okay, thank you. Right. So, what influences the choice of antibiotics? So, we have asked the question, when do you use antibiotics, right? Now, we are going to ask the question, how do we use antibiotics? And the first of those is what influences the choice of antibiotics? Obviously, the etiological agent is important. What is a causative organism? As I've already mentioned, we need to know the antibiotic factors, not only the resistant data, but also does the antibiotic reach the site of infection? A good example of that is the use of aminoglycosides in central nervous system infections. Uh, before the availability of the third generation cephalosporins, if you had an organism which was a gram-negative organism, like in neonatal meningitis, the antibiotic choices were very restricted uh, because the aminoglycosides, which were the main gram-negative antibiotics, anti-gram-negative antibiotics available, this is, we're talking uh, till about the early 1980s, um, didn't penetrate into the CSF. And so they were not particularly helpful in the treatment of neonatal meningitis. The cephalosporin, third generation cephalosporins made a very big uh, change in the management of those infections. So antibiotic factors are important. And obviously patient factors, right? We might talk about that a little bit uh, in the appropriate place. Right. So as I've already mentioned, what is important is what is the spectrum of activity of the chosen antibiotic, right? And have we taken into account any, any knowledge about resistance, right? Okay. So let's talk about spectrum of act activity. Now, these are charts that I have produced. Uh, and they are subject to, you know, you can use these charts to add and subtract as you wish, right? Once you've got the slides, uh, you can take these charts. And uh, I think if you are interested in how you correctly use antibiotics, uh, you will try and and then subtract as new antibiotics come in and so on and so forth, right? But I'm going to use commonly used antibiotics uh, and, and, and try and help you to understand this concept of spectrum of activity. Right, so I've looked at five groups of organisms, the streptococci, which includes streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, staphylococcus, which is mainly staph aureus, Enterobacteriaceae, which are what we call the coliforms, the pseudomonads, which are the non-enterobacteriaceae gram-negative bacilli, though I put pseudomonads there. Yeah? This includes organisms like acinetobacter, organisms that belong to other families, right? And just a little point on anaerobes. Okay, so let's look at each of these columns. Again, remember, this is not for you to memorize or whatever. It's for you to have some understanding of spectrum of activity. Right. If you look at the streptococci, streptococ uh, now here I'm looking particularly at group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, streptococcus pyogenes, right? It is always sensitive to benzyl penicillin. For some reason, it has never developed uh, resistance, right? Now, if it, because it is sensitive to benzyl penicillin and ampicillin, amoxicillin, and so on, um, have the, 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 the right structure for it, the same structure, um, they were just Ad adapted to expand their spectrum to include enterobacteriaceae, uh, the, the, they are equally effective against streptococcus pyogenes. Now, you might not want to use ampicillin amoxicillin because of its activity against coliforms. Obviously, it will have a bigger effect in generating resistance which, uh, to the, in the coliforms, right? Uh, which the use of Benzyl penicillin or its oral equivalent penicillin V will not do. Okay. Now, cloxacillin was adapted or this group was adapted. They are called the beta lactamase stable penicillins and they were, uh, they were, uh, had to be 
developed very soon after the intra introduction of benzyl penicillin, which was in the, la the, la the end stages of the Second World War. Uh, by the early 1960s, uh, uh, Staph aureus, which was sensitive to benzyl penicillin to begin with, had begun producing uh, penicillinase. And so it was no longer effective. And so the beta lactamase stable penicillin first group was developed, which was cloxacillin, flucloxacillin, oxacillin, and so on. Different countries used uh, use the, uh, these uh, differently. I mean, they use them like in the bulk. So, for instance, UK uses flucloxacillin, uh, the United States uses oxacillin. We use cloxacillin, but I understand that some fluclox is available in the country. Okay, so it does have some streptophyre genes activity, but I wouldn't choose it uh, if there was uh, a possibility that the infection was due to, uh, uh, to, to streptophyre genes. Uh, it, it basically effective against cloxacillin. But see what I have read here, written here. MRSA are resistant to all beta lactams except the beta lactamase stable penicillins. So they are resistant. The, uh, the MRSA is sensitive to this group and resistant to, to that group and those two, right? However, much later, uh, inhibitors of beta lactamases, inhibitors of penicillinase were, were, were discovered. And they were then linked to amoxicillin. And so you have what we now know, the, the best trade name that we know is augmentin, but there are many trade names. Uh, so if you're using this in a prescription, you should be using co-amoxiclab, right? And now there is also inhibitors attached to the, uh, the, the, the later developed uh, penicillins, right? So, Basically, the, the, the question here about spectrum of activity can be realized particularly uh, for the beta lactams from, from this group, from these four, right? Because these are or all are oral. This is penicillin B when it's oral. And you can figure out which we want to use. Now, obviously, if you've got an infection where you think it might be a, be a streptococcus pyogenes or you think it might be a, a staph aureus, then uh, sorry, not a, uh, yes, staph aureus. There is an advantage in using coamoxiclab, right? Uh, but remember, coamoxiclab, the actual active ingredient is amoxicillin. So its spectrum of activity is the same as amoxicillin with the addition of being uh, able to work against staph aureus that is producing penicillinase. Okay. Right, imipenem, meropenem is a much later group carbapenems, which I've put into the penicillin simply for, uh, for sort of convenience sake, right? And it's a very good drug against the streptococci um, and intrabacteriaceae and the other gram negatives. It has some activity against anaerobes, right? We don't worry too much about anaerobes actually because we use metronidazole almost uniformly, right? Uh, and so in a sense, uh, but in countries which don't use metronidazole, and you'd be surprised to know that there are countries that don't use metronidazole, this becomes important. Right. Okay, I will move on to the next one now. I, there are some questions. I'll just check those out. Right. Good question. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, streptococcal, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae sensitivity to the penicillins. Uh, there is resistance. Pneumococcus has been shown to be resistant. And there has been work done in Sri Lanka as well to show that there is low-level resistance to uh, penicillins uh, by uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, interestingly, uh, the MICs, I'll talk about this a little bit later in a little more detail because it's related to the MIC of the organism and the tissue levels that are achievable, uh, which, we, which, which we actually... Uh, you know, we don't necessarily do tissue levels, you do blood levels, but you kind of extrapolate it to tissue levels. And the tissue levels uh, are far higher with the later uh, penicillins as well as imipenem, meropenem, the carbapenems, right? And the third generation cephalosporins. And so they still are active. Uh, when, if there is full-scale resistance, then you have to move on to the glycopeptides, 
right? So there is resistance, and you have to know that uh, the 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 sensitivity patterns or the the markers of resistance uh, in the, your local situation. So some surveillance has been done, and I will talk about that a bit later. Okay, let's move on then to the next slide. Okay, the kephalosporins. Now, there were the early kephalosporins, which was kephridine and kephaclor, kephalexin, or, uh, strep, uh, uh, which were fairly okay for minor, uh, mild infections for streptococci. They were not really uh, predictable and reliable against staphylococci, and they had some gram-negative activity. So they had a little place in the treatment of certain infections. That they were, we don't necessarily call them first generation or whatever, but they were the early kephalosporins. Kefiroxim came in, which had much better activity against Streptococcus. It had good activity against Typhorius. Um, Kefiroxim activity against Typhorius is about equal to uh, Coamoxiclav or Augmentin's activity, right? They are, they are almost equivalent. Uh, Enterobacteria also, it had useful activity. So for a long time, uh, we had to manage with Kefiroxim. As I said, the third generation Kefalosporins only came in in the early 80s. And so till then, kefiroxim was the drug of, you know, choice among the kephalosporins. Uh, kefoxetim we have not used at all. We use it in the lab for identification purposes, but kefoxetim is used for anaerobes in countries that don't use metronidazole. Though, metronid though kefoxetim resistance among anaerobes about particularly bacteroides fragilis is now well known. Okay. I'm not going to talk about that because we don't use it here, uh, as far as I know. Uh, keftriaxone and, uh, and keftazidine were the two uh, third generation, kef, uh, kef, actually kefotaxime, which I haven't put here, which is like, I'll put that there now. Uh, kefotaxime and kef, kefotaxime was the first to come. And then subsequently keftazidine and then after that keftriaxone. That was the order in which they appeared. Uh, and what is important is that these are very, very good drugs. They have very good uh, MI, uh, uh, tissue levels, uh, very low MICs among the streptococci. Um, they're they are, they are stable against, the, they're good against medicine sensitive staph aureus, though you almost never use it uh, for that if that's the only infection that they have. They're good against enterobacteria. They don't have anti pseudomonal activity. Uh, Keftazidine was developed to fulfill that need, anti-pseudomonal activity, right? Since then, there have been numerous kephalosporins, and, and I'm not going to mention them. If you ever get a kephalosporin, just look at its spectrum in relation to the ones that you already have. Most of them, you will find, are very little different from the ones that were originally uh, developed and have been used. Their big problem is that because they have a wide spectrum of activity, they, they are very, they, they bring a lot of pressure for, uh, to the microbiome. And so antimicrobial resistance, antibacterial resistance develops very fast uh, with the use of these. These are genuinely broad spectrum antibiotics, right? Right. Kefipine is what you might call a fourth generation. Again, good activity against streptococci and good activity here. Right. I have not used kefipim uh, at all. And so because of that, I don't actually have any practical experience with it. Uh, you might have to ask some other clinicians, clinical microbiologists, about their views on kefipim. Uh, okay, somebody asks me, should we remember these antibiotics and spectrum of activity. What I would like you to do actually is as you go about the wards doing your clinical work, you have enough patients with infections, right? Spend five minutes thinking about the infection and the antibiotic. You don't have to maybe make any comment on it or so on, but if you are unhappy with the choice, just go and look up the spectrum of activity of that antibiotic against uh, the 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 organism that is likely to be the cause of the infection in that patient. The reason I'm telling you this is because this is a habit that you have to develop. Uh, 
as I as I used to tell my colleagues, um, you know, the only discipline that I know, clinical discipline that I know, that rarely uses antibiotics is psychiatry. Right? Uh, but even there, you know, when their patients get some infection, they generally call a physician to have a look if it's in the in the in a hospital setting. But uh, all other clinical disciplines use antibiotics as part of their normal practice. And so when you, when you use an antibiotic, you must know its spectrum of activity. So if you're using only six antibiotics in your, in your practice, it may be a general practice, uh, maybe an ENT practice, uh, whatever, get to know those antibiotics. What is their spectrum of activity? What is the resistance that has been described? Because it, it matters to the patient that you use the correct antibiotic uh, and that you are not misled by, you know, uh, the fact that it is in common use or that somebody comes and promotes its use or, or that, you know, you have had good successes with it. All that is true. But uh, especially as resistance grows, we need to be aware of the, at the early stages of an infection, whether we are using the most appropriate antibiotic, right? So I think it's a, it's a clinical necessity because antibiotics is used whether you're in general practice and so on. Right. I, uh, another question that has come up is, uh, right, so there are two questions that quickly came up. Uh, can we still use penicillin for strep pneumonia? The answer is now the recommendation for serious pneumococcal infections is always the third generation cephalosporin, either cefotaxim or ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone is used more frequently now because it is can be used as a once daily or a twice daily uh, injection, and so you can even use it for patients uh, who are not admitted to hospitals in the Western world. They try to keep patients out of hospital. And so ceftriaxone is their drug of choice. Um, infection now. Uh, ceftriaxone it gives better results. You can give it for a shorter period of time. It's a less painful injection. Um, and the tissue levels are definitely, the, the, the le tissue levels over the MIC, the ratio is much, much higher for ceftriaxone than for benzalpenicillin, right? Uh, but if you have full resistance, and this is why we do need to do surveillance for pneumococcus, um, you know, on a, on a routine basis, uh, if you do have resistance, then we have to move to the third generation, sorry, the, the glycopeptides, the vancomycin. So if you're in doubt that you've got a patient uh, or a patient is not responding, then you have to move. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, and the broad spectrum means, you see the word broad spectrum and narrow spectrum was used initially uh, in the, with the use of benzalpenicillin and other antibiotics that were developed in the 1960s. Benzalpenicillin didn't have any activity against gram negatives. And so that is why it was called a narrow spectrum. Actually, benzalpenicillin has a very broad spectrum of activity, but that spectrum does not include the gram negatives. That is why it was called narrow spectrum. And so lots of antibiotics were developed. The early antibiotics like tetracycline, chloramphenicol, uh, and so on had very good activity, or not very good activity. They had activity against gram negatives, and then ampicillin was developed. Um, and so you started broadening the spectrum to include gram negatives. So I find that that is not a particularly helpful use uh, of a term. Uh, it doesn't tell us exactly what is the usefulness of this drug, right? Uh, so because of that, I would suggest that you don't use broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. If you use it, know what your what the spectrum is, right? Cephalosporins, lots of cephalosporins can be given orally. Again, a question. Uh, uh, as I told you, the early cephalosporins, cephalidin, cephalor, uh, cephalexin, these are, cephaloxin is available both as parenteral and oral. Uh, the third generation cephalosporins are all parenteral, right? Right. Uh, I'll talk about empirical and broad spectrum use a bit later. Everybody is asking about 
broad spectrum antibiotics. Obviously, it's a term that is being used widely. Uh, right, and some resistance about gram negatives. Lots of questions. That's very good, actually. Thank you, because that means you are engaging with what I'm saying, right? Uh, okay, so shall, I, shall I answer the questions uh, at the Towards, well, that's also not good, no? I'll finish the spectrum and then answer these questions, okay? Because there are quite a few questions there. Right. We move on to the quinolones. So now, remember the ones that we have discussed so far? The pen penicillins and cephalosporins together are called the beta-lactams because they have the original beta-lactam ring, right? Uh, but they are two different groups of antibiotics. The third one uh, is... The are, the are the quinolones. Now, the quinolones, uh, I'm not putting out all the quinolones, but these are the quinolones that are used reasonably. Uh, ofloxacin also may be used in this, in this group. Um, remember that quinolones, their original spectrum included only the gram negatives, right? Uh, then ciprofloxacin, which was the most commonly used uh, quinolone, I think, worldwide, uh, included staphylococcus. So ciprofloxacin was effective against gram negatives and was effective uh, against Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, but there was no activity of the quinolones against the, what we call the respiratory pathogen, that is pneumococcus and against streptococci until what we call the respiratory quinolones were developed and levofloxacin was one of the early respiratory quinolones. Now there are others as well, right? Now, these act against streptococci as well, including pneumococcus. Um, they act against aporeus. And they do have some activity against intrabacteriaceae. And they have activity against pseudomonas as well. So you can see uh, that new antibiotics, now the ciprofloxacins came in, I think, in the, maybe the late 1980s, if I remember right. I may be wrong in that. Uh, no, no, it might have been even earlier than that. Uh, levofloxacin came on later in the 90s, I believe, right? Uh, so we are getting what we call an armamentarium of antibiotics, okay? Lots of antibiotics. So that's why when you ask me, do I remember all these antibiotics? Remember them when they are being used because that's an easiest way of remembering that, right? And then try and, uh, you know, maybe discuss with two or three other students uh, what is the spectrum of activity. Just take two or three minutes about the antibiotic itself. Okay, now ciprofloxacin uh, is available orally and so is levofloxacin, but you can also give them parenterally. Okay, so they can be used in milder infections as well as in severe infections. Now, one of the advantages of uh, the, 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 the quinolones is that they have some activity against the atypical pathogens which cause pneumonia. Now, one of the way, reasons why there is a, a, a push to reduce the use of ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and so on, is because they are used in the treatment of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And as you know, we are endemic for mycobacterium tuberculosis, and widespread use of these drugs could cause resistance to develop. Now, we have no proof of this, but this is a, a, a possibility. Okay. So let's move to the next one, aminoglycosides. I've already mentioned the aminoglycosides. Uh, there are four of them, but I think only two are regularly available in Sri Lanka, gentamicin and amikacin. There is nothing much to choose between the, with, with the other two, uh, tobramycin and, uh, gosh, I've forgotten the name of the fourth one. Can somebody remind me of that, please? Uh, gentamicin, tobramycin, nitilmycin. Nettlemycin and amikacin, right? So nettlemycin and uh, tobramycin, there's not much difference between gentamicin and those two. So you can, they, the aminoglycosides don't have streptococcal activity. So don't use them in patients with an unknown cause of meningitis. Because remember, pneumococcus could well be the cause and it doesn't get into the CSF. Don't use them in pneumonia, uh, which is a community-acquired pneumonia because it doesn't have activity against any of the community-acquired pathogens, pneumococcus, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and so on, right? So they're not good drugs for uh, respiratory infections. They have activity against staphylococcus, and we do use them from time to time for that purpose. They have activity against gram-negatives and against pseudomonads, right? They're good drugs, 
Their big problem is, of course, that they are nephrotoxic and they are autotoxic. I think people forget that they are autotoxic. Autotoxic means that they cause vestibular damage, uh, which causes dizziness. In fact, I know one person who was on an amino glycoside. Uh, she was she was mobile and she was out and about and went across the road and was knocked by a car, right? Uh, so you have to be very careful about that. We, we, we tend to kind of not pay too much attention to that. We do need to monitor the levels, angiotomycin level and amicacin level monitoring. I'm not sure whether it has improved. It is certainly not available routinely when I retired, right? So they do have some fairly serious negative effects. Okay. Now, there are lots of other antibiotics. I'm not going to go through them. You all can now that you have some idea of what spectrum means, you all can go through them. And when you come across the antibiotic, just have a quick glance at this. This is a very simplified uh, sort of chart. Uh, start with that and then maybe if necessary, you can go on uh, to more complicated charts. Okay, now let us me try and answer some of your questions before I get to the next stage. We're not doing very well for time, Champa. Can we go on for uh, longer than one hour? Yes, madam. We have until 10 o'clock. Ah, okay. My goodness. Right. Okay. Let's start off with the first question, broad spectrum. I've already tried to explain it. It's not a term that I use uh, and it's not a term that I encourage you to use because it doesn't actually tell you what organisms the, organ the antibiotic is effective against. As you saw, there were some antibiotics that are effective against lots of organisms, and we call it narrow spectrum. Uh, the spectrum, this narrow spectrum, broad spectrum, original use was for the inclusion of the gram negatives, enterobacteria and pseudomonads, right? Uh, nothing, nothing other than that. Okay. Uh, can we give Right. So because of that, uh, there are no definitions to identify. I will, I've given you a definition. I'm not sure that everybody will agree with that definition, but certainly uh, you need to know the spectrum rather than calling it broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. Right? Uh, can we give cephalosporins orally? I've already answered that question. Um, is treatment with broad spectrum antibiotic and empirical treatment the same? No, they're not. Empirical treatment is when you use an antibiotic, without knowing what the causative organism is. You have some suspicion that the causative organism might be something like streptococcus, but you don't know for certain, right? So because you have a, a, a reasonably good suspicion that it's streptococcus, you start on an antibiotic that has activity against streptococcus, right? That, so that, that is what you mean by empirical treatment. Broad spectrum treatment, as I said, I don't use the term, uh, but if you have... If you have, say, for instance, an abdominal infection, say somebody has peritonitis after a bowel rupture, then you know that the number of organisms in there uh, are going to be wide-ranging. There will be anaerobes, there will be uh, various gram positives, uh, like you know, there are there is enterococcus and other organisms that live in the gut, and there are a wide range of gram-negative coliforms. Pseudomonas is not a common uh, uh, not commonly found in the gastrointestinal tract or in the colon, but there are other gram negatives that are equally um, resistant to a lot of antibiotics within the, within the colon. So what you then use is not a broad spectrum antibiotic. You use a combination of antibiotics to cover this wide range of possible microorganisms, right? Uh, there is no single antibiotic. And so you use, that's why you use quite frequently a beta-lactam and aminoglycoside and metronidazole. That's a very common combination for gut infections because you're covering gram negatives, you're covering enterococci. Uh, remember when you use the cephalosporin for your beta-lactam, cephalosporins don't cover enterococci, but thankfully enterococci are not very, uh, you know, they're not particularly virulent. And so maybe we can sort of manage them. But usually you use a, a penicillin beta-lactam 
probably one of the if, because uh, peritonitis is life threatening you would probably immediately go for the best option you have maybe ticacillin uh, clavulanate or piperacillin clavulanate with uh, an aminoglycoside maybe gentamicin uh, and uh, metronidazole right so uh, try not to use the word broad spectrum antibiotic in that in that kind of context uh, So the broad spectrum antibiotics that I've, I've mentioned are, if you look at the spectrum of activity, let me go back to that. Uh, where is it? Not stuff. Okay. Okay, we can even look at that. So say, for instance, in the penicillins, uh, so, sorry, the carbapenems are what you might call a broad spectrum, right? Because remember, they include enterobacteria. But remember, they don't have very good anaerobic activity. They don't have very good staphylococcal activity. So if you're using them for an infection where these are likely, then you have to add another antibiotic. Tricacillin clavulanic acid, as you can see, is very good activity against a wide spectrum of organisms, right? If you look at the cephalosporins, look at the, uh, the, the keftriaxone or kefotaxime, they don't have pseudomonal activity. However, keftazidine has pseudomonal activity, but doesn't have activity here. Right? So these, though we call these wide spectrum or broad spectrum antibiotics, they do have gaps in their spectrum. Okay, and that we need to remember that kefipine is a, a, again has got a, a good spectrum of activity, or it's it's wider than some of the others. Right. So so there there are lots of what you might call broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, but I would be cautious, as I keep repeatedly saying, uh, to to be to be mindful, say for instance, levofloxacin has a wide spectrum of activity. And because these include things like the respiratory pathogens, uh, you know, the atypical pathogens, their, their spectrum is actually even wider, right? Which the cephalosporins and, and the penicillins don't have, right? So the, the term is actually the term that I, you know, I, I find very unhelpful, right? Okay. Right, so somebody wants me to repeat. Okay, 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 okay. Let me go back. Oh gosh, loads of questions. Right. Is there beta lactamase resistance properties in third generation cephalosporins? Uh, the problem with uh, uh, beta lactamase activity is that there are as many beta lactamases or, or, or you know drug uh, uh, enzymes that break up various bonds in these beta lactam drugs as as there are organisms. I think there are huge numbers uh, that because organisms are striving to stay alive. You see, they're trying. I mean, it's survival, and so as soon as the a drug is introduced, uh, they maneuver their genetic, uh, you know, what, what their genes uh, to produce an enzyme which attacks the drug. So there are, uh, there are enzymes that split uh, kefotaxime, there are enzymes that split practically every uh, kephalosporin that you can put into the, into the system, okay? Uh, so that is why we need uh, data on resistance activities in very locally, even within the within a hospital, within a city, within a country, and so on. And I think we need to get this systematized as quickly as you can. But you also need good microbiology services that can give you uh, reliable results on sensitivities on isolates from individual patients. That is the only way that we can be safe uh, about. So we will use the data that we have, the surveillance data for empirical treatment. Uh, and then specific uh, data from the patient sample and its sensitivity pattern uh, for uh, for changing the antibiotic if necessary, uh, if uh, you know once the sensitivity results come back. Right. Let me see. Gosh, lots and lots and lots. I'm finding it a bit difficult to move this down. Hmm. Sorry, I'm just taking a little bit of time to move down the questions. 
uh, right patient who had cellulitis do we recommend penicillin lifelong certainly not right uh, you don't give lifelong pen penicillin or any antibiotic for cellulitis you treat until the patient is better and you stop the antibiotic so uh, we have what is called de-escalation of antibiotics and I'll maybe talk a little bit about that later. But any patient with cellulitis, you treat for that time. If you have recurrent cellulitis due to group A streptococcus, then you, we need to find some way of reducing uh, or finding out why the patient is getting cellulitis uh, in a recurrent fashion. And that, that in that kind of situation, consult your microbiologist because they will give you options, right? Uh, next question, is it, is it correct to call all beta lactams as insensitive? Uh, sorry. Sorry, MRSA being all beta lactams, uh, whether you can use all any uh, any beta lactam for MRSA, and the answer is no. You have to have you have to have uh, antibiotics that resist the activity of the beta lactamase, right? So therefore, you have to use the penicillinase stable penicillins and cephalosporins uh, for treatment. Right? You can't use any beta lactam. Okay. Best antibiotics for pseudomonads? Uh, I think you can. You, I mean, you have a choice now. Earlier we never had a choice, uh, but now we have a choice. So you can use among the penicillins. You can use ticacillin, piperacillin. Among the cephalosporins, you can use cefazidine, cefipime. Uh, there, there is no oral there. The oral antibiotic uh, that we have is ciprofloxacin among the quinolones. So you have uh, at least some kind of choice. And obviously you have gentamicin and amikacin, right? So you do have a wide choice now. Right, I'm missing one question. Okay. There's one question which has something. Right. Sorry, if I haven't answered anything particular, can you repeat the question? Because I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm seeing the whole question. Uh, you can't use aminoglycosides to treat meningitis full stop. Okay. That's another question. Can, can't we use the aminoglycosides alone to treat meningitis? You do not use men, uh, aminoglycosides to treat meningitis because the aminoglycosides don't get into or don't penetrate the CSF barrier. Okay. So if you look at the, the CSF levels of aminoglycoside and look at the MICs, the minimum inhibitory concentrations, which we'll look at in a minute what that is, uh, you'll find that the CSF levels are below the level, below the level required to inhibit or kill the, uh, the organism. So aminoglycosides are never used. Before the availability of uh, keftazidine, for instance, or, or the third generation cephalosporins, uh, there were trials with intra um, you know, with aminoglycoside being injected into the CSF, uh, they were not very uh, successful, right? So basically, do we have to combine it with another antibiotic? It doesn't arise because you don't use aminoglycosides for meningitis. If you have systemic illness for which you need aminoglycosides, then that's, that's a different story. You can use the aminoglycoside for the systemic infection, but you have to remember that that doesn't get into the CSF. Okay, right. I mean, casein have poor penetration to conditions like pelvic abscess. Yes, that is the other problem with the aminoglycosides. They don't actually, in fact, in fact, very few antibiotics penetrate into abscesses. And so essentially if there is pus, the, the penetration of antibiotics into pus is abysmal. It's very, very poor. So you really need to drain the pus as your first line and then add an antibiotic if there is uh, infection around the area which has had the pus. Uh, and in that situation, uh, aminoglycosides may play a part and would probably play a part. But for the actual abscess itself, it has to be drained. I don't think there is any place for uh, antibiotic uh, in, the, in the treatment of an abscess. The pus has to be drained. And if you are around in theater when pus is drained from situations like this, please get a sterile bottle and get some pus and send it to the laboratory or prompt the, the junior doctors to do that 
so that we can do the microbiology of that because these are very very likely to be caused by different organisms and we need to know what the organisms are and the sensitivities remember the first set of slides i did you need to know what the organism is and its sensitivities if there is a wider infection or wider inflammation inflammatory lesion uh, spreading uh, infection and so on in these patients right ha ah, covid pneumonia <laughs> Right. I hope I'm not going to drop any bricks here because I am not in clinical practice now. I do read uh, what's going on, but not in great detail. Uh, one thing I'm very certain is there is no prophylactic use of antibiotics in COVID pneumonia. That I have read very clearly uh, in many guidelines. There is no role for prophylaxis because uh, if if an infection, if you have given prophylaxis. the chances are that a secondary bacterial infection would be due to a drug resistant uh, organism which is definitely what you don't want in patients whose lungs have been seriously damaged due to the coronavirus right uh, we'll come back to this when i do pneumonia okay uh, uncomplicated treatment of uti i i'm doing uti treatment so i will do that empirical treatment i will do that when i do the uti part otherwise we might not have time to go to that okay uh, right what is the difference between empirical antibiotics and prophylactic antibiotics now i didn't do a slide on prophylaxis i thought about it and didn't do it prophylactic antibiotics are given to prevent an infection from becoming uh 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 what can i call it uh, you see when you get an infection if you look at the pathogenesis of infection uh, what we call an infection when when we call something an infection in sort of lay terms it means that patients have symptoms however in every patient who has symptoms prior to the symptoms itself the organism has entered the tissue and as microbiologists and pathologists we would call the infection at that stage when the organism has entered the tissue now many of us when we get infections all the time like that organisms entering our tissues uh, our own body defenses get rid of the organisms and so we have no symptoms now prophylaxis is given when you are wanting to prevent a disease that means infection with symptoms is what we call a disease we want to prevent a disease infectious disease or infective disease from developing in a patient who has a likelihood of developing that disease right so when i do utis i will talk about it a little bit so that hopefully we will understand a little bit empirically is when you know that somebody has a, a clinical disease in fact a disease that is caused by an infective agent okay so there are terms here which i haven't put down maybe at the end if i have time i will put down some of these terms so that you have a better understanding of how you use these terms basically you have an in, you, when we get infection it is we call it an infection when the organism has penetrated into our tissues right most of those infections we deal with with our own defenses and we get rid of the organism so there is no clinical disease where you have clinical disease is is when we call i mean in lay terms that is what we call an infection but in pathological terms uh, it is when you have an inflammatory reaction and that leads to symptoms i mean you can see this very clearly with covid right and and so empirical treatment is at that stage when you have got the symptoms right when you've got pathological changes that are causing symptoms that you know about okay prophylactic is before the symptoms develop and you only do that when the chances of uh, there are very specific indications for giving prophylaxis right now the question about covid is okay when somebody has a covid you know infection with some respiratory symptoms uh, if we give an antibiotic will we prevent secondary infection and the clear answer to that that i have read and maybe you know others who are reading more about it might want to add to that is that prophylaxis is definitely not indicated you treat after the when when a patient has 
got an infection, you treat with the appropriate antibiotic. Otherwise, the risk is that you will end up getting infected with multidrug resistant organisms because you're generally in an intensive care unit situation or in a high dependency situation and your chances of getting infected with multi-resistant organisms is very high. You certainly don't want to increase that risk. And it does no benefit. That's a, that's a problem. Okay. Abdominal infections, uh, the, the combination I would use is generally uh, a, a, a late, uh, a, you know, one of the later penicillins, ticacillin or piperacillin uh, with, uh, uh, with clavulanic acid, if possible. Uh, and uh, uh, people might not agree with me, by the way, yeah? and uh, I haven't looked, so, so you, you, you can discuss it, right? But certainly something like peritonitis, uh, where there has been a bubble spillover and so on, I would I would very early go for a very very uh, uh, you know a combination of antibiotics that will have the best chance of knocking off all the bacteria in that in that area. So that with an aminoglycoside with metronidazole would be my choice. Yeah, imipenem is also a possibility, by the way, a beta lactam instead of the ticacillin or piperacillin and imipenem. Okay, I'm going to do MICs, so I've got to come to concentration dependent and time dependent. I've got some slides for that, so I'll go to that. Uh, in pediatrics, all contacts of Neisseria and Haemophilus meningitis give rifampicin as a prophylactic. But Sri Lanka is TB endemic. Can we use that? I, uh, meningococcus as a cause of uh, pediatric meningitis in this country, I certainly never met uh, before I came, uh, till I retired. Meningococcus, for some reason, seems to be very, very uh, sort of low key in this country. Uh, whereas in the UK, for instance, I met lots of patients with meningococcal meningitis, meningococcal uh, septicemia. Um, and so on. Uh, Haemophilus influenzae, <laughs> these have come into now practice guidelines in the West. And so they are being used here. I think this is a good question and needs to be thought through. Yeah. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. In the West, certainly it's given, it's, it's routine. Uh, if you have a meningococcal meningitis, not, they're not so, uh, because the, the incidence of meningococcal sepsis and meningitis in direct context of patients with meningococcal sepsis or meningitis uh, is far higher than in the general population. That is the, the baseline from which prophylaxis was started. And the prophylaxis uh, is then given to all first line contacts of patients who are proven meningococcal sepsis, right? Uh, proven meningococcal sepsis, they don't give it. Uh, so you need to isolate a meningococcus or have a PCR positive uh, and, and and then prophylaxis is given, right? Haemophilus meningitis, people are a little less uh, insistent because the, the data was not as strong. However, it's a recommendation. If you look at any guidelines, you will find that. So I think it's a very good question that you have asked and it's a question that needs to be raised, yeah. Madam, does that mean we give combination of antibiotics and also single antibiotic, which covers many bacteria as broad spectrum? <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, basically, I would call a combination of antibiotics wide spectrum. I'm trying not to use this word broad spectrum because it has got a particular use now, which is very difficult to take off our people's minds. But a wide spectrum of antibiotics, yes. Uh, you know, you need a wide spectrum to cover the wide spectrum of organisms that might be in that particular area, right? And, and intra-abdominal infections due to, you know, perforations and things like that uh, are where you would find the most number like that of patients like that. And they can go into acute sepsis very fast. Uh, and so you really need to get the antibiotics in there, the appropriate antibiotics in there as fast as you possibly can. Right. 
so they are they, you don't talk about a single antibiotic as I, as I said for a single antibiotic i would really 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 recommend that you you, you start thinking about not using the term broad spectrum but rather think about each antibiotic's actual spectrum okay my goodness gracious there are 21 messages <laughs> when you are going to get i'm going to do a uti and so i will i will talk about ciprofloxacin in uti uh, benzide uh, okay there's a question on allergy champa can i ask you to do something for me yes madam can you see whether you can put the questions in groups uh otherwise we'll never get most through most of the there. questions have come to you personally madam i can't see them ah so what can i do then <laughs> right okay i don't know why they're sending it personally but uh, because it's going to take us some time uh, i okay i'll try and finish the lecture before i do the questions otherwise we, we won't finish the lecture okay okay we've done all that so we'll go down right Okay, so we look at some antibiotic factors, right? I'm going to do this fairly briefly, otherwise we'll run out of time. Uh, now, when you look at antibiotic factors, right? What we look at are both pharmacokinetic factors and pharmacodynamic factors. Now, pharmacokinetics is what happens to the antibiotics from the time we take it, okay? Uh, and I'm not going to deal with that. Well, I'll deal with it very, very sort of in passing. Pharmacodynamic is what we call the PD profile, right? And that is what happens to the antibiotic once it gets into the body, once it gets in the body in terms of its concentrations, okay? So now supposing you take an antibiotic and you give it, right? And this is usually for parenteral antibiotics, by the way, where it goes up like that, uh, so, you know, so rapidly. The oral ones will generally go up a little more curved like that and at lower levels. Right, so the, 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 the blood levels of the antibiotic goes up to what we call the peak. And then it slowly starts coming down like that, right? So these curves will vary for different antibiotics, okay? Um, and, and they get like a, like a, it's not like a mean curve, but they, they get the curve. They do this, when they are trialing the antibiotic, they do this in volunteers and they plot the curves and they get the, 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 the kind of, pattern of the curve for that particular antibiotic, right? And, it is, and then you also do what we call the minimum inhibitory concentration of the antibiotic for the organism. That is the minimum amount of antibiotic that is required to inhibit the multiplication of the organism or replication of the organism. And, and this is, there are standard tests for that with standard controls and so on. But before uh, any antibiotic is released, the, whatever the, 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 the pharmaceuticals who are developing that antibiotic have to do all these tests and have to actually put the results out, okay? They have to, public, they have to put it publicly. So we have for every antibiotic and against every organism that has been tested against it, both the, the peak of the antibiotic and also the minimum inhibitory concentration of the, antibi of the antibiotic for that particular organism, right? So you have charts like this. Now, when we do that, obviously this doesn't change. The MIC stays standard. The antibiotic concentration goes up and comes down and the antibiotic concentration at that, that, that is found in this area is called area, uh, now, I've forgotten what AUC stands for, area under the curve, right? But remember, it's the area under the curve that is above the MIC level, okay? But we also look at the time it takes for the antibiotic concentration to fall to the MIC level, right? So that is what we call time-dependent uh, PD profile, and this is what we call the concentration-dependent PD profile. One student had actually asked the question. Okay, now why is this important? Because it on this 
you decide that this antibiotic is going to have an action against this organism. Now there are certain antibiotics that the action seems to be dependent on this AUC or VMIC, right? Whereas there are other antibiotics whose action seems to be dependent on the time it takes, right, for the, the, the antibiotic levels to be above the MIC, okay? So those are called the time-dependent antibiotics and the ones that, are, uh, that have the act activity dependent on this, the area under curve over MIC, the concentration-dependent antibiotics, okay? Now, you all don't need to know too much about that, but that, that is the principle on which these antibiotics are, are called by these terms. And also, it is the principle that decides whether you are going to give this antibiotic 6 hourly, uh, 8 hourly, 12 hourly, uh, or once a day. Okay? Because obviously, uh, the longer it takes, if, if this peak is not very high, and it takes a very long time to come down, then you can give it, though it's not very high, you can still give it less often than you have, you can give something where the peak is very high and then it drops very fast, right? right. Because you, you need to then make sure that that peak comes up again and that comes up again, right? So then you have to maybe give it eight hourly or six hourly. So the, the trend has been to try and develop antibiotics to give much less frequently uh, than what we had to give penicillin. For instance, if you're giving IV benzyl penicillin for a pneumococcal meningitis, there are times when you have to give it four hourly in order to get maximum effect. And which is one of the reasons why benzyl penicillin has gone out as the drug of choice. Uh, for the treatment of meningitis, pneumococcal meningitis, right? Uh, okay. So basically, time-dependent antibiotics, their inhibitory effect is effective because their concentration over MIC, they have a high concentration over MIC or this ratio for a prolonged period, right? Uh, they remain in the blood or the tissue for a long period of time at MIC, at levels above the MIC. I think that's a better way of putting it. So the dosing interval is determined by the time concentration above the MIC. So if, if for instance, in keftriaxone, if the MIC, if the, 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 the serum levels uh, are higher than the MIC uh, for 18 hours, 12 hours, whatever, then you don't have to give the next dose till it drops below. Right, so so that all that is done at the stage of trialing the antibiotics or testing the antibiotics and trialing them. Okay, so all the the beta lactams, clindamycin, macrolides, uh, the oxazolidinones, which you may not have come across, linozolid, which is now being used for serious gram-positive infections. Uh, these all have, are time dependent. Right, the concentration dependent antibiotics. You want drug concentrations of 10 times above the MIC for the target organism at the site of infection, right? And this is the problem with the aminoglycosides. And the clinical response is predicted by the peak, this drug concentration, above the MIC, right? That is sometimes or the AUC, area under the curve, over the MIC. So the quinolones fit into that and the aminoglycosides fit into that. As I said, you don't have to know too much about this, really, uh, just, to, just to understand it if somebody mentions it. Okay, so let's move on to the MICs. And I, I just want to bring out certain factors from these two slides, right? Firstly, look at the MIC and MBC of penicillins to streptococcus pyogenes, okay? you see that actually they are all pretty low, okay? Now you look at one mega unit of penicillin IV, either given as a bolus over four minutes or as an infusion over 60 minutes, and you find the serum concentration after completion of the bolus, after completion of the infusion, and the mean serum half-life, which is very short. Now these are time-dependent, uh, antibiotic, right? 
So because it's very short is a reason why you have to give benzyl penicillin so frequently. Now, if you compare that, I, I, mean, I haven't got you the data because I really didn't want to push your heads with a lot of stuff. But if you compare it with, say, keftriaxone um, or some of the antibiotics in that group that I use 12 hourly, you find that this serum half-life of that particular antibiotic will be much longer than this. Right? And with MICs at the same level, you will find then that obviously these antibiotics will be more useful in clinical management than benzyl penicillin. Okay, that's just, that's just what the one point that I want, two points that I want to make with this slide. Right? Okay. Now, this slide may explain to you a little bit about what I was saying about infection and infection prior to symptoms and infection with symptoms. Prior to symptoms, you see, when an organism gets into our tissues, the organism starts multiplying. And so you have the bacterial growth, which we teach you in, in, in our very first lectures in microbiology, right? The log phase, the stationary phase, and the... You all remember what the last one is called? Okay, you can go and find that out. Okay. So now, basically, we are interested in the log phase. Now, usually, when it comes to this sort of level, our defenses come in and block off the infection so that you really don't have a clinical infection. But when that doesn't happen or for some reason can't happen, without antibiotic, the organism climbs, right? With antibiotic, what you are doing really is you're not eliminating the organism you are actually reducing its replication. And so what you're doing is you're keeping the, anti the organism at levels that the defenses can eliminate the organism, right? So this is actually the basis of using antibiotics. No antibiotic will eliminate the organism from the site. Ultimate elimination from the site is by your normal defenses. What the antibiotic does is reduce the intensity of growth, right? Or oh, sorry, the, 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 the speed of growth of the org organism and therefore limits the number of organisms at the site, right? That's what you're trying to do. So in specific places, doing this is helpful in preventing a clinical infection. And that is what we call prophylaxis, okay? So for instance, if somebody is likely to get endocarditis, infective endocarditis, uh, because you have bad teeth, and so the oral flora gets into the bloodstream and, and, and you have some cardiac defect or, and, and valvular defect, and so they, these go and settle on the valves and, and then produce infective endocarditis. Therefore, you got the idea of prophylactic antibiotic before any dental work on patients who had cardiac deformities that were susceptible to infective endocarditis. Now, that is a huge area in its own self, right? But the word prophylaxis came into being in, in that kind of situation. So prevention of the organism, which is already there, from settling down to cause a clinical infection. So it has very, very few applications in clinical practice. And we must make sure that we maintain that application. So one of those is, say, for instance, you give prophylaxis for surgery where there are what we call clean contaminated kind of surgery. Right? I haven't got a slide on that for you. But essentially, if you have a, 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 a a surgical procedure where you are going to have uh, some organisms from inside spilling over to cause an infection or the risk of infection is uh, or the consequences of infection uh, is, is, is disastrous, right? Then you give an antibiotic at the time of the incision to have peak levels during the time of the incision and have sufficient levels to cover the period of surgery. That is also called prophylaxis. So very, very 
specific, right? Uh, don't use the word prophylaxis uh, in, in, in other situations, okay? If you're not sure, just ask, uh, you know, your microbiology consultants or lecturers, and they will explain that to you further. Right. So we come back to our summary questions, uh, right? Does this patient have an infection that requires antibiotics? Are antibiotics useful or necessary in the treatment of this infection? Would microbiological invest in, in, uh, investigations be necessary before starting antibiotics? What information do we have on, on, on resistance? And then we come to two additional questions. Can I now stop antibiotics? Or can I narrow therapy? Or do I need to change from intravenous to oral or the other way around, escalation? from oral to intravenous, right? Or from one intravenous choice, our empirical choice, to a more definite choice, right? And then how long do we treat? Now, I can't do this for everything. There is absolutely no time for that. I will just do it for a few. And I'll start with the easiest, which is uh, urinary tract infection. And I'm going to actually suggest uh, that we try and think algorithm. Algorithm is you go from one step to the next step in a sort of, you know, in a, in a definite manner, right? And you find lots of algorithms for treatment um, in, in the medical literature, right? So you take a urinary tract infection. Essentially, what I talked to you about earlier, women getting urinary tract infections with no other predisposing factor is what we call uncomplicated UTI. Their only risk factor is a short Actually, I should say our only risk factor is a short urethra. Okay. And so you find women coming with this urea frequency loyally. Uh, I'm seeing UTI and I get asked for advice on management of UTI in many, many elderly people who, have, who are not catheterized, who are mobile, who are very active and so on and so forth. So it's not only in young women. Now there, the treatment of choice always used to be what we call urinary antiseptics. Drugs that did not go beyond the bladder, right? Uh, and I think the, the, the drug of choice for most people, uh, particularly for a first episode, would be something like nitrofurantoin. Uh, the only thing about nitrofurantoin is that it, uh, it, it can make you nauseated, right? But apart from that, I'm not going to go into details of the drugs because there is no time, right? Uh, but if there are questions, I'll deal with them. Uh, but you can use norfloxacin among the quinolones. I would tend not to use ciprofloxacin. Uh, I would use the earlier quinolones, um, especially for a first episode or a second episode. Uh, there used to be another drug called nalidixic acid, which I, uh, I'm, I'm now aware is not available. Uh, the other, other, other kephalosporin somebody had asked me, uh, they should work. Yes, kephalexin. Remember that many of these antibiotics are concentrated in the urine. And so even though their MICs may be, their, their drug levels may be low in, in the systemic uh, circulation uh, in the urinary, in the urine itself, they may be very high. And so they work and you give it for three days, right? Uh, now, actually, there is also an option of a single dose, uh, but I have never used a single dose. I use a three-day course, right? But I also tell these women, and this might be useful for you all also individually, for your own families and so on. If you have a U UTI, uh, then to, uh, particularly, to, particularly if you are postpartum, that is after pregnancy, uh, and also in the elderly, uh, I would I always suggest to people that they do what we call double mepturition. That means they pass urine, wait a couple of seconds, and then pass again. Because, uh, you know, our pelvic flows uh, tend to sag, particularly after we've, uh, we've had babies, um, also as we get older. And so when we do that, a little amount of urine remains in the bladder, which is not passed out when we pass urine normally. And so that becomes a place for this ascending bacteria from the urethra, which you know must be happening all the time, uh, 
to settle and set up an infection. And if you actually do this, you can reduce the number of re recurrent UTIs uh, in quite a few people. In my experience, it works very well, right? Also remember that, uh, you know, sexual intercourse uh, can result in UTI. And so it's worth asking patients uh, whether, whether this happens after, uh, you know, intercourse. And then if that happens, postcoital antibiotic does work, just a single dose. Uh, Prophylactic antibiotics I would only give if there are recurrent UTIs in children uh, because otherwise the only thing that happens is that you again cause infection with resistant uh, gram negatives, right? And I have now had to give advice to people, doctors who call me, you know, these are from Colombo and so on, uh, who are managing elderly people, elderly women. Uh, on whom so many antibiotics have been given that their urinary tract infections are due to multi-resistant antibiotics. They're otherwise perfectly okay. And, and, and so it's very, very difficult to then get rid of these organisms. So I would be very careful about long-term antibiotics in, in the women who have recurrent UTI, right? Uh, right, complicated UTI is the other possibility. Now, what is a complicated UTI? Anything that is not an uncomplicated UTI. That's the easiest way of remembering it, right? So women with urethra being, short urethra being the only predisposing factor is uncomplicated. Everything else is complicated. So babies, young children, renal abnormalities, predisposing factors. Sorry, I've got a spelling mistake there. Uh, diabetes. Uh, now, in all these, I would strongly suggest that you do a culture. In this culture, it's not needed, by the way, I mean, uncomplicated UTI, unless it's a recurrent UTI when I would do a culture just to make sure that the organisms are sensitive. In others, I would, I would not ask for a culture, whereas here, everyone, I would, I would say that it's mandatory to do a culture. And then we need to use an antibiotic with tissue penetration. So we cannot use nitrofurantoin in this situation. Right? And I would be very careful about using nit nitrofurantoin long term in patients with diabetes and so on, because you have a very painful um, peripheral neuropathy with nitrofurantoin. Now here, you can review for prophylaxis. But again, I would be cautious, right? Uh, with children, uh, with babies, in, in fact, uh, you know, there is a very definite form which all pediatricians would use, and I would uh, generally, uh, you know, refer the patient to a pediatrician uh, to manage if there if a child has a, a UTI because uh, recurrent UTI with reflux can result in renal damage, which can result in renal failure later on in life. So this has to be managed carefully. Uh, all the others again need specialist input uh, because you need to re uh, to review for prophylaxis, investigate for anything that can be corrected. Uh, for instance, renal stones uh, can, you know, result in recurrent UTIs and so on, right? So remember all this as an algorithm, because then at least it tells you which direction to go. And also remember catheterized patients, because in catheterized patients, if they're asymptomatic, that means they have no fever, uh, they're not having any pain anywhere, suprapubic uh, pain, loin pain, whatever, uh, the recommendation is that you do not treat uh, a, a bladder that has organisms because all you do then is to replace sensitive organisms with resistant organisms, making it very difficult to treat them if they actually get sepsis, right? Uh, I'm, this is very difficult to follow this, but it's something that we need to think about and make and try and ensure that we do we we change the catheters often we use aseptic uh, measures in managing the catheter you remove the catheter as soon as it's possible to remove it um, and you know the catheter because when you put a catheter in you are taking away your defense and organisms can swim up between the catheter and the urethral lining uh, to the bladder and so colonization of the bladder becomes normal right? So you do not treat with antibiotics unless there are symptoms. That's the recommendation. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Time is running out. Pneumonia, 
community acquired pneumonia uh, is basically a healthy child or adult having a pneumonia with no predisposing no predisposing factors right now it's very important to remember that only about 20% of community acquired pneumonia is due to pneumococcus and as we've already talked we do need the epidemiology of resistance in order to make sure that we treat that 20% even properly now the problem is that it's very difficult to make uh, etiological diagnosis in pneumonia so obviously here you would do a blood culture i'm sorry the person who asked me how to do a blood culture i don't have the time to uh, explain that to you uh, could you ask one of your microbiology lecturers to show that or just go along to the lab when you have a little bit of time and see how it's done right because that will make you remind remember it much more clearly uh, maybe not in covid times but uh, ask and see whether you can you know find out how it's done uh, now the atypicals mycoplasma pneumoniae chlamydia trachomatis legionella pneumophila they all have their specific diagnostics uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae you can do a serological diagnosis legionella pneumophila you can do a serological diagnosis there here you look for the antigen in the urine here you look for the igm antibody in the serum right chlamydia trachomatis i'm not sure that you have a diagnosis uh, in this country and anyway even in countries with very good uh, diagnostic services chlamydia trachomatis diagnosis uh, is not uh, pneum pneumonia diagnosis is not easy okay right uh, so i'm going to go through very quickly how do you treat you basically have depending on the pneumococcal resistance you have uh, 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 you know you use the guidelines and i'm going to take you through the national guidelines just for this to introduce you to the national guidelines and also take you through uh, you know what the national guidelines say hospital acquired pneumonias or lots of predisposing factors here particularly uh, for ventilation and aspiration uh, and new blood cultures and uh, deep cultures from the respiratory tract if a patient is ventilated then uh, you know samples from the 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 actual lung itself if possible uh, we do need antibiotics with tissue penetration and just like i told you about abdominal infections here the the, the organisms can vary very widely and so we really do need to uh, to to try and treat uh, to cover the possible range of organisms not easy at all in this situation by the way and i would probably go for a carbapenem like imipenem uh, or meropenem uh, because that covers a very wide range of organisms that can cause uh, se severe pneumonia in this situation Right? But you also have to remember that culture may re reflect colonization or even contamination, right? Uh, in in respiratory samples. So because of that, uh, we may be misled by the culture here. Unlike in urine cultures, right? Here we may be misled, and so we need to keep that in mind. Let me just share with you the guidelines. Now this is from the Sri Lanka College of Microbiology guidelines, which were produced in 2016. Uh, they use what is called the curbs core a uh, curbs core is you may have heard of it when uh, your respiratory physicians did uh, some work with you or your icu physicians uh, it, it it's a uh, it's you you grade something as mild or moderate or severe right you can look at it from the the slides because you can you can the slides will be available to you um, now one interesting thing that i noticed was that in the mild form they give them they suggest amoxicillin or kefuroxin right definitely now the duration of treatment for pneumonia has got shorter and pneumococcal pneumonia has got shorter and shorter and shorter they are seriously talking about five day durations now uh, but five to seven days has has been there for a while uh, oral kefuroxin can be given 12 hourly right but remember if you are giving kefuroxim parenterally you have to give it 8 hourly right so the 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 time interval is very important when you are when you are thinking about whether you are going to give oral and iv at the same time intervals and i think you can't remember all of this so having access to some 
source where you can look it up quickly, either online or a, a, a book source. Uh, I remember when I was working in England, all the uh, young doctors used to carry uh, the BNF, the British National Formulary, which gave everything and they used to have it in their pockets. And every ward had a BNF so that every, somebody could go and look up. And now I think it's available online for them. So they can look, look up something very fast, uh, which is very important actually. Moderate, again, uh, they suggest admission. Uh, and they would again give amoxil, uh, you know, I, or, or kefiroxin parenterally with clarithromycin. Now, I'm a little uh, uh, doubtful about all this because I think mild, where they don't have any of this, can well be due to an atypical cause. Remember, pneumococcus is only about 20%. Uh, and so atypical causes are, are, are quite likely, it's particularly in mycoplasma. And so I would say here that I would add uh, either erythromycin or, or one of the macrolides, right? Um, here they are giving clarithromycin. So I have some question marks about these guidelines, but the guidelines exist. And they are Sri Lanka College of Microbiology guidelines, which have been prepared with all the other colleges. So these were prepared with the uh, chest physicians, right? Now, severe here, they are considering either keftriaxone or kefetaxime with clarithromycin and to consider other things. So it's not easy. I can't give you, say, this is what you do, right? Except for this. In this one, of course, I'm quite happy to give uh, amoxicillin and clarithromycin or erythromycin. Uh, if it, 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 clarithromycin is better because it can be given less often, uh, but erythromycin is also as good, yeah. Because remember, this could well be due to the atypicals, right? And it's for some reason it's not in the guideline. Okay. Upper respiratory tract infections is the is the big problem actually because it's probably the commonest cause of inappropriate antibiotics. Somebody asked whether if you have a virus infection, you can give antibiotics as prophylaxis was unknown with upper respiratory tract infections, right? This is not just my view. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is in all antibiotic guidelines that you will find, you will find them saying this, right? So if you have a second, if you, if you get a viral infection, remember the symptoms range, right? Duration of symptoms can vary. Everybody thinks that a viral infection will get better in three to four days because they're thinking of rhinoviruses, cold viruses, but the adenoviruses, the influenza viruses, even the earlier coronaviruses, which were known to be causes of rhinorrhea and so on, lasted much longer. They could last anything up to about seven days, even 10 days. And post-viral cough is common because these viruses cause a lot of damage to the respiratory tract. And it takes the respiratory tract quite a long time to recover uh, its intact uh, you know, epithelium and therefore its intact defenses. And so our coughs continue, right? And, and, but unfortunately, when there is a cough, particularly if they bring up some sputum that looks a bit colored, antibiotics are given, right? And this is, this should be reduced as much as we can, initially for ourselves, then for our families, then for people who, it's very difficult to convince people they don't need an antibiotic. So we have to do a lot of work to try and reduce antibiotic use for this because this is one of the major areas where antibiotics are used inappropriately and probably contributing to resistance developing, right? One thing to remember, particularly with this post-viral cough, some of these I say for your own use as well, right? Is that you can get bronchoconstriction, uh, post-viral infections. And so it might be useful to take a, a, a bronchodilator for a little while and see whether the cough gets any better, right? But this is, I mean, I've been dealing with this recently as well, where people are insisting that they want an antibiotic and I've been saying, no, 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 no. And uh, some listen, some don't, okay. So throat, again, group A streptococcus causes only 15 to 20% of sore throats. 80 to 85% are viral. And you cannot differentiate 
uh, a viral sore throat from a streptococcal sore throat. So what do you do? Now I'm going to introduce you to some other guidelines. I have just a little bit of time left, right? Go through these timelines. Sorry, where is my respiratory one? Oops. I have got the timelines. I will, uh, I will load them up and you know find out from Champa how to get them loaded up so that y'all can have a look at it, right? Because these timelines uh, tell you how to go. NIS is a National Institute of something excellence. I can't remember what the C stands for now, uh, right? So and and, and it, it's it's from UK. And it's actually very helpful. Uh, how do you go, right? It, so I've got knee sidelines for sore throat and for acute sinusitis. I don't think I have time to show them. Actually, I can. I'll see if I have time, I'll show them right at the end, right? And then very, very quickly, uh, the management of surgical site infections, right? Again, go through this and see. You can see this is from a uh, from a American source. I've given you the source at the bottom. I have actually blocked off as much as I can things that are inappropriate for us, and try to include things that are uh, that are used in this country, right? So, how do you manage surgical, uh, sorry, skin and soft tissue infections, and how do you manage on the next one? Uh, uh, surgical wound infections, post-operative surgical wound infections, right? Uh, go through them at your leisure. If you want to discuss them with me, uh, you can, um, that's up to you all. Uh, so that you all get some idea that the usage of antibiotics, in a, in a sense, the easiest thing to do is if in doubt, give an antibiotic. But as I've already mentioned, this does cause a lot of problems long term. And I think we, we need to be mindful, just as we are mindful of the environmental harm we are doing, uh, as we are mindful of uh, so many different other things that we do, which, which, you know, which harms us. This also is something that has a very strong potential for harming us individually, actually, uh, because you never know, uh, you know who and who will get uh, a serious enough infection that requires an antibiotic and then find that there is no antibiotic because the organism is multi-resistant and we don't have any antibiotics, right? So go through them. Unfortunately, there is no time. I've just put a little bit about new antibiotics and, and some of the alterations that are happening to antibiotics. This is just for your, you know, for your knowledge, you know, to know what's going on in the field and how we try and steward the use of antibiotics. This word is used a lot now, antibiotic stewardship. Uh, agreed, you know, we need to have guidelines. Uh, we need to have guidelines both locally as well as nationally. And there are international guidelines as well for things like malaria um, and some other diseases. A lot of parasitic diseases have international guidelines. Uh, and how do we select our antibiotics? Try and see whether you can uh, persuade yourself to do generic prescriptions, right? Um, and then who can prescribe what? How many days should we treat? I've already introduced you to some algorithms and I've already mentioned that we need to do resistance surveillance. Right? I'll just see whether I can stop this share and share, uh, right, I need to go and open up something, one minute. Okay, can you see that? These are the NIS guidelines, right? Uh, can you see it, Champa, can you see it? Yes, madam. Okay, right. So I've got NIS guidelines for sore throat and for respiratory infections. 
which I can upload and you all can have a look at it and then you all can go and see whether there are any other guidelines. They're actually quite nicely done uh, because they say, okay, if you have, uh, you know, this is for sore throat, uh, when you don't give an antibiotic, when you can consider an antibiotic, or they, they, they give actually backup antibiotic prescriptions. And I thought that is a good idea uh, because lots of people, if they know that they can go and get a prescription, they go away and if the child gets better the next day, they don't actually go and get treatment. Um, and I think, you know, we, we underestimate the intelligence of our patients. And I think if we, you know, if we talk to them, we, because these are very common reasons for antibiotics, and generally speaking, and I have been told this anecdotally by many people, uh, they, they get a prescription, they go and get the antibiotic. I was once told that uh, by the person itself that the antibiotic cost 750 rupees. They didn't have, they didn't have money. So they bought just four, four uh, capsules, went home, took the four capsules. They were better and that was the end of the story. So incomplete treatment. Uh, inappropriate treatment with antibiotics, and we are contributing to antibiotic resistance. So go through these NIST guidelines. If any of you want to discuss them with me, please feel free to do so. I will upload them so that uh, you can, you know, perhaps look at this a little bit more. Right. Okay. Let me just try and see whether I can, uh, in the next four minutes, uh, do some of the questions. Uh, do bactericidal antibiotics kill bacteria? Yes, they do. But actually, for most treatment, it doesn't really matter whether you what antibiotic you take, because as I told you, the antibiotic prevents replication, allowing the body defenses to get rid of the bacteria. Now, there are very few instances where this is uh, this either we don't have the time for that, or where the, the defenses cannot enter. And a good example of that is bacterial endocarditis. Uh, a second example of that is meningitis. Uh, because the organisms uh, are in positions where the defenses don't work very well. So because of that, we need to, uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, in those instances, uh, the other one is where you have no in, uh, defenses, like for instance, a patient with leukemia or a patient on um, immunosuppressives or an HIV patient with a, a very low CD4 uh, count. Uh, they don't have any defenses. So there are, we need bactericidal antibiotics where the organism can actually be killed. But for by and large, we don't really need bactericidal antibiotics. Uh, parenteral and oral is dependent on the tissue levels on on the tissue levels we want the seriousness of the infection really uh, not uh, and so that is a choice that you make if if for instance if you have uh, a milder infection then you might have might as well get away with uh, with with a with a oral antibiotic so for cellulitis which is fairly fairly mild and where there is uh, you know, it's not spreading fast. There are no other predisposing factors like diabetes. Uh, I would be happy to give an oral antibiotic uh, and, and uh, or sometimes a choice depending on if staphylococcus is likely uh, and, and then see what happens, right? Uh, so that, those are some of the last few questions. Uh, let me see whether I can go up a bit. Right, bactericidal, you see this whole, all these terms of bactericidal and so on. For pneumococcus, uh, you give, uh, yeah, you do give a bactericidal and a bacteristatic. The thing is, these organisms, these uh, antibiotics may not be bacteristatic for the atypicals. They may well be bactericidal. So this question of bactericidal and bacteristatic also depends on the antibiotic and the organism. So Staph aureus, sorry, penicillin, is thought, thought as a bactericidal antibiotic, but in actual fact, it is bacteristatic for a number of organisms, right? So I, I think these are not helpful terms now. They were introduced, I mean, I think we need to stop using them. So they're not helpful. That's my own, that's my personal opinion, by the way. Right, now somebody else has asked a question. Pelvic abscess, kefuroxim, and metronidazole found to have resistance. Can we, 
sensitive to cefotaxim, gentamicin, and amikacin. You can do, I, I, would, I would actually, if somebody has an organism sensitive to gentamicin and it's on gentamicin, I would leave the gentamicin and change the amino glycoside. Gut organisms, actually, I am more in favor of using the extended spectrum penicillins, but that's up to you, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are giving prophylaxis either before infection, isn't it? For instance, just like lepto and malaria. Well, um, I'm not sure about prophylaxis for leptospirosis. Uh, for malaria, yes, you, you give prophylaxis before. Uh, that is because if you are bitten by a mosquito and inject the malaria, the, 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 the agent has to be there before the malarial parasite gets into the liver, gets into a protected place. Yeah. Uh, leptospirosis, I'm not at all sure about the whole area of prophylaxis. I'm a bit doubtful about it, actually. Okay, I think I'll have to stop now, 10 o'clock. Shampa? Or is it, is a, yeah, it's 10 o'clock. It's 10, madam. Uh, are there, is there any uh, other questions? Because, I mean, we can go for a few more minutes, no problem. Right. Loads and loads of questions, <laughs> honestly. Uh, what are the antibiotic better penetration for you? I think for all these things, you need uh, the algorithms or the, 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 have a look for some of these questions. Now, for instance, infective endocarditis. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. There are some contentious ones. Why do we use antibiotics in pediatric viral meningitis? I think part of the reason for using antibiotic in meningitis has been the very poor microbiology services. Uh, I have to say that um, until uh, 2012, which is not that long ago, uh, am I right in uh, 2012 or 2002? 2002, I think. No, when was Gitani uh, consultant of Candy? 2002, I think. No, yeah, from 2002, uh, only we've had microbiologists in the hospitals. And for them to develop services to be able to diagnose um, uh, some, the causative agent of meningitis and so on took a long time. I think we are improving slowly, but uh, because these were not depended on uh, for the treatment management of patients, and presumably the clinicians didn't want to take a risk of missing a bacterial meningitis, uh, they gave antibiotics to everybody who they were not sure, uh, you know, whether they didn't have a bacterial meningitis. For instance, uh, many patients would have had antibiotics before coming in to hospital and so on and so forth. The LPs were not done for many children, uh, but there was a real fear. Uh, so when I tell you that in the UK, every child with a suspected meningitis has an LP done, uh, at least 5 ml of CSF is sent to the laboratory. And so the pickup rate of pathogens is extremely high. Uh, now here, the pickup rate of pathogens in meningitis is extremely low. And we have to move in that in order to give confidence to clinicians that antibiotics are not needed. Uh, I, think, I think that is the answer to that question. Uh, there is no question of secondary bacterial infection in viral meningitis. Right? Viral meningitis, depending on the cause, has its own prognosis and for most viral meningitis the prognosis is very good patients get better on their own uh, but there are one or two uh, in, there are some causes viral causes which have uh, um, uh, a more negative prognosis right uh, and antibiotic type according to ages is not really a, 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 a not really a problem I mean there is some concern with the use of some antibiotics in children but that is only if you use them very long term. Um, you know, short-term antibiotics, I doubt that uh, there is a problem relating to age, right? Uh, uh, prior to surgery, giving antibiotics, is you, they give it usually with the anesthetic IV. You, know, you, never, you, you give it as close to the incision time as possible. So therefore, you either give it just before you in, uh, induce or just as you induce, depending on who you have in the support team. 
Right, let me just see what are the other questions. Can you get antibiotic resistance even when we use antibiotics as topical form? Unfortunately, yes. And a good reason for that, a good example of that is mupirocin. Mupirocin is what we use uh, for as an antistaphylococcal agent in a local form. It's also used for clearing MRSA from uh, uh, people when you want to, when you do a, a, a you know, a, a decolonization, um, you use mupirocin as nasal, a little nasal rub. Unfortunately, mupirocin resistance is being reported. So I think, anti uh, remember, antibiotic resistance is about the virus, uh, sorry, the bacterial, uh, you know, it, uh, need for survival, right? So they, so they are very good at that because they, they, I mean, most bacteria that cause human disease uh, divide every 20 minutes. So they have an enormous advantage in terms of developing, you know, ways of surviving. Uh, right. Uh, aminoglycosides in respiratory infections, one uh, use of it, which is, which is uh, always done, is in cystic fibrosis. Now, I'm not sure whether we have much cystic fibrosis in Sri Lanka, but in temperate climates, it's very common. It's an autosomal uh, not 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 a dominant recessive form, but uh, they, they, I mean a large percentage of say the UK population has the gene, so so you end up having cystic fibrosis, and the initial infection with cystic fibrosis is usually staph aureus, but by age two, pseudomonas colonizes, and in that instance, aminoglycosides are given, but as I said, penetration is fairly poor. And so, you know, basically cystic fibrotics are, uh, are dealt with in the respiratory clinic and they have other ways of giving their aminoglycoside. They give it as an inhalation and so on. Uh, that, that, I mean, you all don't need to know that, but it is used in respiratory infections in situations like that. Um, ma ma Madam, are there strains that are resistant to beta-lactams with beta-lactamase inhibitors as well? Uh, I don't know actually the answer to that one. Anyone among the staff there who know that? Okay, I need to find that out. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, but anyway, there are lots of other choices. Huh? So, but these are the problems. The more they develop resistance, the less our choices will be. Uh, how do we select oral over IV? Because you all see most of your patients in the hospital sector, uh, in the hospital sector, you know, quite often IV will be used, but basically it's dependent on the severity and on tissue levels with oral and IV. For instance, in with say chloramphenicol, which is rarely used now, tissue levels or serum levels with oral and IV are almost the same. So if a patient can swallow, uh, then you give you can give oral even for serious infections where you're using chloramphenicol. Uh, you don't have to give IV, uh, but there are very few drugs like that. Mostly IV gives better levels. A specific question: Is it need to give lifelong antibiotics after spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? I have not heard of that. No, I have not heard that you have to give uh, lifelong. But I'm I, I'll have to look that up actually because. I don't think I've ever met a patient with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis to have to deal with it clinically. Uh, but you know, these are questions you could ask your microbiologist, right? Uh, and I'm sure they will give you time and answer because you want to know for a good reason. And I, I think they will respond appropriately. Um, Madam, are we giving penicillin prophylaxis after splenectomy yet or is it changed? No, 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 you have to give prophylaxis. Uh, they say for, I'm not sure whether they say for five years now or whether it's for longer. Sometimes these things change. So if, if I have a patient who has had a splenectomy, I would always go and look it up. And so this is what I would like to end up telling you, uh, because I think we've gone on long enough now. Um, you know, when in doubt, look it up. Remember, even if you're the most experienced person, something new could have crept in. Uh, or you may have forgotten something important. Um, so especially things that are rare now, splenectomy, you know, I have come across 
regularly when I was working. I haven't come across any, obviously, now that I've stopped working. But if somebody asks me now, I will always look it up and only tell them the answer. Even if I know the answer without looking it up, I will still look it up to ensure that what I'm saying is right uh, and appropriate, right? Uh, Cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins is there, but uh, unless you have had anaphylaxis, I don't think people are too concerned about it. They will give cephalosporins, uh, but as far as I know, I mean, a benzyl penicillin is IV for whoever asks that, but there is an oral form called penicillin V, penicillin V, V for victory, right? Okay, I think I shall stop there now, uh, Champa. I have never had such a barrage of questions. <laughs> I'm glad you all are interested in uh, in organisms in in uh, uh, in antibiotics, and I hope that you will stay interested because remember, you will all use them for the rest of your working lives for other people, but also the rest of your lives, even for yourselves and your families. And thankfully, the internet didn't play up. Okay. So can I say good night to everybody? Thanks very much, Madam. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for the marathon session and for answering all those questions. Um, it's, I mean, it's a great benefit to the students to have someone like you to do the session. And I'm glad that they got the chance to learn from you. So thanks very much, Madam.